Good evening. Thank you for joining us on Healing Conversation. It's a thought-provoking episode. For those of you who are catching on to part two of my conversation with Dr. Wisani, you will think back of part one where we scratched the surface and spoke on the importance of mental health during pregnancies. I'm particularly fond of this topic because I, for one, those of you who know my story, are well familiar with the struggles I had as a pregnant teenager. Dr. Wisani, I would like us to start by talking about the mental health challenges that teenagers face. And this is a topic that is very close to my heart because having interviewed a couple of teenagers, I've picked up suicidal tendencies. Mm. I've picked up the fact that people would openly say, I thought of harming my child. Mm. And some have said, I actually blame my child because my life would not be like this mm. had I not had this child. Mm. Hmm. Yes, yeah. Um, I think let me start where I say, you see with maternal mental health, we call it, this is pregnant women, mental health for pregnant women. We would say when you screen and you get this, this level, you should refer to psychiatry. But we actually say refer all teenagers. Mm. It doesn't matter what, what screen you get. Mm. Because with teenagers, it starts with the, oh my, I'm pregnant. What, what have I done? Right? Mm. So now the teenager has to deal with the fact that everyone knows I had sex. That is shame. Mm. That is a lot of shame. You've shamed yourself. You've shamed your parents. You've shamed your community. You've shamed your church. You know, you've shamed everyone. So now you have to walk around with the shame. It's mm. visible to everyone. When you're done with that, there's usually a lot of rejection from the baby's daddy or the father True. of the baby. True where it will be things like, I do not know if the child is mine. Mm. Now, this teenager has to try and prove something that is difficult to prove because she is sitting there saying, I've only been with you. But you are coming to say, I don't know if the child is mine. And that can only really be tested once the baby is born. Mm. So the teenager has to live with the shame for nine months. On top of that, now it's the parents. Sometimes financially, the family was struggling before the extra child. Mm. Sometimes it's not the finances, it's the emotions of the home, an extra child. And some parents struggle with having a teenager who fell pregnant because they self-reflect. It's almost to their parents as if we failed to raise the mm. same. We did something wrong. Yes, we did yeah. something wrong. So there is all this that are going on in the mind of a teenager. But remember, teenager is a transition from childhood to adulthood. That is the one time in a human being's life where the hormones in the body are unstable. Mm. That's why we tend to say teenagers are moody. It's because the child is trying to figure out what kind of an adult they are going to be. Mm. So they actually don't know who they are because you need to know who you are to know who you are bringing into this world. Oh, yes. So it's chemically, hormonally a very difficult time. But then there's the social aspect of shame attached to it. So it, it, it's actually a lot for teenagers. And I think we need to support them. Yes, they've made a mistake. Yes, this was not planned, but it is here. Mm. You know? It is what we, it is. Yes, yeah. we need to take care of, of, of the pregnant teenager because uh, there's a hormone that we call cortisol. It's a stress hormone. Mm. When you're stressed throughout your pregnancy, it means it is high throughout pregnancy. It's supposed to come and go. Now, the child that is born is actually born very sensitive to anxiety so you find that those kids are what we'll call anxious children mm. because they were exposed to these stress hormones throughout the pregnancy because it was not a joyous pregnancy it was not a celebrated pregnancy it was a pregnancy associated with a lot of stress so now the teenager now has to have a child who will probably grow up to be a very anxious child and that alone anxious children need very strong mothers need mothers that know who they are but now this anxious child is born to a teenager who is still trying to figure out who mm. they are as a person. Themselves, yes. yeah. The ability or even the inability to say, I can actually take care of someone else. Ah. And, um, you know, also the fact that um, one is looking at, to a certain extent, you know, I would call it mourning. 
you know, with the, the transition of being pregnant as a teenager, mm. there is an element of loss of dreams as well. Mm. And that just, um, you know, makes it worse on the mental health side of it. Mm. Mm. And, and we find teenagers who become despondent mm. and who lose all hope. Mm. And um, they, they feel that I cannot just take care of this baby. Mm. What about my dreams? Mm. What about who I was and wanted to achieve mm. before this? Mm. Mm. Um, does that ha have an effect in what we see now? You know, babies being abandoned. Mm. Um, you know, um, in the news recently, there was a baby, a fetal in a plastic bag. Mm. How does that really one, how does as a society, we get to that point where this is the reality? Mm. of us mm. as South Africans. Yes. Mm. I think there's the girl, the teenager, who dreams of saying, I want to be an advocate, mm. you know? I want to complete my school, I want to go to university, I want to do this. And then they fall pregnant, you know? Um, and you know someone will say, why would a teenager have sex? Because teenagers have hormones that they don't understand. Remember, the body is preparing them to be adults. Mm. So there are feelings that okay with the mind of a child, mm. but with feelings of an adult. So sometimes they find themselves doing things that they did not plan, and they find themselves in trouble. But it takes a lot for the teenager to say, I still want to achieve my goals because if they never go become an advocate mm. they're going to be a miserable mother mm. they'll probably resent that child their whole life because that child will be a standing walking uh, reminder of yeah. what i could have been mm. but we also have to think of the mental health aspects there are those that say i know that abortion is legal in south africa but I want my child to be alive. Mm -hmm. I know I'm not in a space to look after this child, but I want my child to be alive. And I believe somewhere there's a woman who might better take care of my child. And there'll be those kids that the teenagers that will give birth. And after they give birth, they realize I cannot do this. Mm. And then they'll go drop off the child somewhere. Someone can come to us to say, why don't you go knock in a hospital and say, here's a child. Mm. Unfortunately, the process of giving your child to the government, I will say, mm. is a very lengthy process. Because I suppose that's, that's, that, that's a very interesting issue that you raise. Because we, we quite often hear in the news how children are left at the gate, how children are, you know, a mother walks out of the hospital and just disappears, mm. you know, leaving the child behind. Mm. And uh, um, you ask yourself, why did they just not bring the child? Hmm. Oftentimes you pick them in the dustbin. You, you know, you will pick them up in a place where it seems the mother does not even want to be traced. Hmm. Mm. Is this the, the, the red tape that you, you, you are alluding to? Yes, I think that the difficulty with government is that there are laws. Mm. I can't just walk in and say, here's my baby, I'm leaving, without them making sure that mentally I'm stable enough to leave the child. Mm. Unfortunately, that comes with a lot of questions to assess my mental health in my ability to leave the child. So I'm at a place where I'm not sure I want to leave this child, but something in me says this child is better off without me. Mm. I cannot sit through questions because I am not sure, you know? Mm. So it might be easier for me to leave the child at the door of the clinic or something like that. And, you know, it's just that we don't know. Sometimes you might find that there's a mom who stands and watches until that child is picked up. So she walks home knowing oh. someone picked up my child, but they will not stand where they are sitting, mm. you know? And, and, you know, sometimes we can say a child was found in the bin and we are there thinking, who leaves a child in the bin. But it's possible that the mind of the mother at the time thought the bin is warm mm. compared to the... But the we associate floor. the bin with dirt. But the mother saw the bin as a place of warmth for the child. So sometimes it's very easy for us to jump to judge, you know? Because when you're standing on this side, you see a six and someone sees a nine. Mm. And we're unable to view from the other side. Sometimes that is the best that this woman, whether teenager or not, can do 
for this child. The other thing is that a country like ours, which is an amazing country, and as, a, as an advocate, you would know, some of these laws don't work well together. Mm. When mm. I'm pregnant and I'm a teenager, I'm able to decide on the future of the baby inside my belly without my mother helping me. Mm. When I deliver a child, now I go back to being a child, and now for me as a child, and a minor, to decide on another life of a minor, it's not that simple. Mm. So the, the law sometimes, there are loopholes that are left there. So now when I come and I leave a child and I'm 16 and I'm leaving a newborn, now they have to trace my mother. Oh, yes. You know? Mm. Mm. So it can be legal, whatever is going to happen, but I cannot be maybe in that space where my mother is asking me, are you sure we sunny you're leaving this child? Mm. So, so sometimes there are difficulties. It's just that we are quick to assume, you know, these kids, these teenagers, you know, when there's a lot behind. Sometimes they have tried and they were told, why did you have this baby if, mm. you know? Mm. And so they are mm. thinking, I can't deal with questions that I can't answer. Let me leave the baby and someone better than me mm. will look after this child. Sometimes at home they told me, do not come back yeah. with that child. Do not come back as long as you're pregnant. So I have nowhere to go. And I feel for me to have a future, let me go leave this child. Mm. Sometimes because it's the mind of a child, they even believe that when I'm now an advocate, I can go back and look for my child mm. and find my child. But because of the mental health, a lot by the time you become an advocate, you don't even know where to start because you actually did not leave your name with your child for mm. you to be traced. Mm. So it, 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 it's, it's a difficult, mentally exhausting time. And a decision to let go of one's child cannot be easy. Mm. Like I say, abortion is free, but some kids will say, I want my baby to yeah. leave, yeah. you know? <clears throat> but I have no clue where to start with ensuring that my baby has a better life, sometimes even better than mine. Mm. Mm. Let, let's, let, let's go to the, to the mental health challenges of those people who make the decision that I want to abort my child mm. and um, the you know effects thereof mm. as opposed to one who says I would rather not I would rather have the child mm. and I've, I've experienced people who cannot deal with the guilt you know um, it's, some, it's something that they do but they, they do not really do it with the full comprehension Mm. Of, the, of the emotional and mental challenges that accompany the decision. Mm. Mm. What has been your experience in that? Yes, I, I think some things you know once you've walked a specific journey. Mm. I think it can be easy for us to sit and say, abortion is easy, you know, it's, it's blood, it's not a baby, you just do this and it's out mm. and you move on, right? But our belief systems are different. But I think sometimes what might force some girls to go for abortion as opposed to adoption, deliver and adopt is that sometimes you don't have the nine months. You have nowhere to stay. You were mm. told at home, as long as you're pregnant, do not come back. Mm. You know, so you have nowhere to go. So for some, it's not a choice. A, oh yeah, no, I can fall pregnant and I'll just abort. Yeah. Sometimes it's, I don't know where to go. Sometimes the parents have not said anything. It's the fear of yeah. what they will say. So you would rather get rid of the proof. Oh, but yes. after the proof is gone, that is when the emotions come because you were driven by fear. Now that fear is gone and you sit back and you realize, I, mm. that's not what I really wanted to do. Mm. But at the time, so now you live with this guilt. And there is also the belief that when there is infertility in, in a relationship, we assume it's because the woman had an, an, an abortion. Mm. So there's a lot of stigma even around that where now I say, okay, when I complete and I now want to go and get married, what if I don't have kids because I did that? Mm. So, so mental health of, of a teenager or an unmarried young woman who still depends on their parents and there's this pregnancy and what to do. There's actually a lot and... Unfortunately, we miss that. Mm. You know, we, we, we are not there to say before the fear, before the decision yeah. to abort, before the decision to keep and go for adoption. Where are we as men mental health care practitioners? Mm. Are we there to say to these kids, these are your options, one, two, three, four, five. Mm. Which one suits you best? Because some of these kids don't even know that there's adoption. 
Mm, you know, mm. they believe you give birth to a child, you take the child home. Yeah. They don't know that there are couples that are there that would love to have a newborn mm. baby. They don't even know where to go start to say, I am pregnant now. When I deliver my baby, I can't look after my baby. Can you find me a couple mm, that mm. can take over? We do not have those facilities, especially in the rural areas. Let's talk about the, at what point does one's mental health challenges migrate to the psychiatric yes. challenges? Hmm. Yes. Um, you know, when I usually explain to, to my patients and they're trying to ask what's the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist, mm. I like saying that, you know, neurologists work with the brain and the conditions that come from there. And psychologists work with the mind and the problems that come from there. Psychiatry is the combination. We okay. work with the brain and the mind and the combination and the problems sometimes that come from there. There are mental problems that result in physical problems. Mm -hmm. You know, a good example is that depression can present with a lot of body pains where someone ends up being addicted to painkillers, mm. but they're actually trying to self-medicate depression. Mm -hmm. There are those, we call it psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, where someone has fits that look like fits, or they have a stroke that looks like a stroke, but when you go see your physician or your neurologist, they say, no, no, this is not a stroke, they refer to psychiatrists, and you're thinking, I can't walk, why are you sending me there? It's because the mind is so big and so strong, and it can overpower the brain such that when the mind is unwell, the, when the mind is unhealthy, it can affect the functioning of the body. Mm. But we are able to see that, you know, if it's a stroke, we expect this leg and this arm and this side of the face not to work well. But when it's a, I'll call it a mind stroke, you'll find that it's both legs that are not working. Mm -hmm. But we're able to say, okay, we understand the body is not working, but the problem is from the mind. Mm. And we're able to reach there, treat that, replace whatever chemicals that might be missing via medication to get the body back to functioning. So a psychiatry, uh, in our culture, I think we were, there wasn't that many of us to begin with, especially psychiatrists. And I think the more and more that are there now, we are supposed to be there to come and say, mind and body, you can't separate the two. Mm. The two work together. And when the two are not in peace with mm. each other, mm. then there are problems. And sometimes those problems have to come to psychiatry. So you can start off as a minor depression, what we'll call a mild depression. But it can progress to a severe depression where someone even develops psychotic features where you start hearing voices of saying, kill yourself, mm. you know, jump off a building. Yeah, suicidal um, uh, um, thoughts. thoughts yeah. Yes, and remember with suicidal thoughts, they don't start with, go hang yourself. Mm. They start where you say, I wish I could sleep and not wake up. Mm. They start where you say you're driving out and type saying, you say, I wish a big truck can come and hit me. Mm. That is suicidal thoughts. We call them passive suicidal thoughts, but you're already on the red zone. Mm. And that is the time where you have to come and say, you know, Dr. Wisani, yesterday as I was driving, there was a big truck in front of me. I wished I could sway in front of it because I feel I don't want to live anymore. I want the pain to stop, but I don't want it to happen in my hands. Mm. I do not want to kill myself. So sometimes a car accident or something like that will take away the pain mm -hmm. and take me out of this without it being my, my responsibility. And yeah. that is where we come in because when it reaches that level, it's not only the mind problem. It means now the brain chemicals are involved. Mm. And sometimes we have to bring in medication to rebalance the chemicals so we can talk through whatever stressors got you to that place in the first place. Mm. I'm going to ask this question. I think it's key. What is the difference between the mind and the brain? Because to me, sitting here, I always think, my mind is fine, which means my brain is waking. Mm. Mm. Okay. Brain, we can touch. Oh, yes. You know, when you open mm. the skull, we can touch and, and fiddle with the brain, mm. right? Mm. The mind is almost like spirituality. It's a space. It's mm. a, you know, the, the mind, when they say the mind is vast, yeah. it's because the mind is not confined to anything, mm, mm, you know? Mm. It is, you know, I think when we say that the person, this is a container and this person is spirit, the mind is almost associated with the spirit. Mm. It's something we can never touch. But so there is this, this mind, uh, you know, some will call it the conscious mind. This is the part of the mind that says, who are you? Who's mm. saying, you know, 
Where do you stay? Where do you work? These are the things that are here to you. Then there's what I like saying is the fridge. You know, if you want to have an apple that's in the fridge, you have to open the fridge and take out the apple. And this is the part where if we say, where does your malume stay? You might not remember. You mm. might not be able to direct me. But if we take you and we put you in the village where Malume stays, you'll mm. get to the house. Because that information is there. It's just hidden. But when necessary, mm -hmm. you can access it. And then there's the third one, which I call the freezer of the mind. Because with the freezer, even when you open the freezer and take out the apple, it's frozen. You can't just eat it. And these are the things that are not accessible to us. And this is where most of the trauma resides. Mm. Because when something happens to us when we are children, and the mind of an eight-year-old says, this is too vast for you to process, then it, it goes and it gets hidden mm. in the freezer. You know, but unfortunately, things in the freezer affect us because sometimes we find ourselves where we are in areas where we are triggered. We don't know why we are triggered because the memory of the trauma is gone. Mm. But there are clues to, so to say, protect you from the same trauma. So it leaves clues to say in this environment, don't go there. Mm. And I think um, an another one, I was watching one of your shows. They were talking about where someone was raped as a child. Mm. Uh, they might have even forgotten the actual experience and remain with, I know I was raped. When they get older and they get married and they settle down and they know I love this man with everything I have. When they have to be intimate now, they get triggered mm. because there are traumas that are hidden and clues were left to say when you're alone with this gender and this, then you get triggered. So. A woman would sit and blame themselves to say, but I love this man. Mm. You know, I, I want to be with this man. I do not know why I am failing. Mm. It's because there are things hidden in this vast mind that we don't remember, but they're able to influence our everyday lives and everyday activities. Mm. So the mind is vast. And, and especially psychiatrists, we need to bring in the mind and the brain together to make Aosun Tavi Singh the best that Aosun Tavi Singh can be. Mm. It leads me to my next question. How do I best take care of my mind? Because, um, you know, hearing everything that you've been speaking about, it takes my mind to my journal. And um, I wrote that journal because I felt myself slipping into suicidal thoughts again. And um, I had just lost my mother-in-law and I didn't know how to cope. So I started pouring it out on paper. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's something as small as journaling. It's something as small as, as um, consulting a psychologist, we say. But what is the right order that one can actually say, I'm, you know, I'm actually being proactive mm -hmm. in taking care of my mental state? And to the fullest, not just on the surface, but to the fullest. Yes. Um, I think to answer your question, I was not be saying, and we said I'm not the same, mm. you know? So what works for you will not work for me. Mm. You journal. And when you journal, you're able to connect with your inner being and you're able to let it out, the pain out, and it's easy. Some people paint. Some people oh, play music, yes. mm. you know? Mm. Others work. There are those that will clean the ceiling, clean the floor, scrub everything, take everything out. And during that process for them, the mind is able to process, mm. you know? I would say, if you're not sure, start with a professional, start with a clinical psychologist, start with a specialist psychiatrist to say, I know I'm not well. Maybe I feel myself slipping into a, a, a part of my life that I was not happy. Where do I start? And as we go through this journey with you, we then find what works for you. You know, for some, they used to think that they, they hate writing. And once they're introduced to journaling, they realize that, I actually can open up to myself mm. because there are certain things that even when we say psychiatrists and psychologists are professionals, no one wants to say them through their lips because it's their own personal secret. Mm. But when you can journal, there's no judgment. It's you. So it, it, it's different things. Um, but as long as we live, our mind lives and it continues. Mm. And the mind of an eight-year-old and an eight-year-old will never be the same. So as long as you're alive, seek help you know when we grew up they used to say go to a dentist at this stage this stage and that stage now they actually say every year you should mm. go to a dentist to make sure things are fine it's called preventative health 
I think with mental health, we need to reach a place of preventative health. You need to come and say, Dr. Wisani, am I fine? Mm. You know, and then we explore because like I say, with where our country comes from, there's a lot of trauma. And some of this trauma came through the genes. It was passed on, you know, and the trauma continues. And sometimes I think I'm fine because I had an amazing mom and dad. Mm -hmm. But actually there is trauma there because maybe my mother had her own trauma or my father had his own trauma. As much as he fought hard to be a good parent, he had his own trauma. And sometimes some things would sleep. Mm. So, you know, sleep out. So now I need to come and say, Dr. Wisani. You know, I know I'm a mom and my wife, I'm a this, I'm a that. But sometimes I have episodes where I wake up and I'm not fine. And yeah. I have no clue what's going on. Am I fine? And we take it from there to say, let's make it preventative mental health. It's interesting that in the society that we live in today, the tale of a country, the high suicide rate, the high postpartum rate, of depression um, and all that is really happening around us says to us we are a society and a community that is prone to mental health yet we take very little effort in that area to safeguard ourselves if anything my prayer is that this episode will provoke you to be proactive when it comes to your mental space Tap regularly into that mental space and ask yourself, am I fine? Is this how I should be feeling? Why am I feeling this way? And above all, who can help me so that I figure out what is going on? This may be the best decision that you make for yourself and not only you, but for your children as well. Happy mom, happy baby. Happy wife, happy husband. Happy parent, happy sibling. We are all in some way tied to one another, like the tapestry of fabric. Our well-being affects those around us. Have a wonderful evening. This has been Healing Conversations. I'm Tabi Singwepe. The good Lord bless and keep you mentally sane. yourself a copy of our latest books, The Mending of a Broken Vessel, and Maintaining Your Joy, a journal for daily positive living, visit a bookstore near you.